Jesus. In our desperation, in our longing, we lift our eyes to the heavens. The Savior that was promised reached down to us, becoming flesh. At his entrance, they laid palms at his feet, as today, in his presence, we fall to our knees. We cry out to him, hanging on the cross, the righteous one whose blood broke the curse. With an act of love that saved our souls, overflowing redemption, making us whole. No nail to the bones could hold him. No crown of thorns could shame him, because he is the one. No tomb could contain him. Death could not stop him. He conquered the grave and rose from death victorious. We cry out, Jesus, 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 you are the resurrection and the life. In you, all things come alive. We will forever declare the mighty power of your name. We cry out with everything we have. We need you, Savior, and nothing else, because in you we are saved by grace. Your glory will shine upon the world, and every tongue will cry out, Jesus is the Lord. Good morning, Christ Community Church. Please stand and join us for worship.
of the Lord this morning. Amen. Can we welcome our online campus here this morning? If you're new with us, my name is Matt. I'm the lead pastor here at Christ Community Church. It's my privilege to serve here as a pastor. Uh, it's just such a blessing to be a part of this great family. Uh, if you are new, we'd love for you to take a moment, find this connection card in the seat in front of you. If you're online, it's on our website. Take a moment to fill it out. We would love to know that you are here, get to know you a little bit, and also help you get to know us. It's a great way to share a prayer request, to take the next step in, in, a, in a growth track or baptism or joining a group. We would love, love, love for you to fill this out, and someone will be in contact with you within 48 hours or so. We're going to prepare to worship through giving at this time. At Christ Community Church, we believe that everything that we have was given to us by God. And as an act of worship, we bring the first fruits of that back to Him, the first fruits of our financial blessings in our life. And so as we give, it's an act of worship, it's an act of sacrifice. It says to God, thank you for providing it, and we're trusting you, God, to do it again. And so we appreciate your consistent, cheerful, and sacrificial giving. Our church is 100% supported by your giving. And so all that you see going on around here at the North Campus, in our community and around the globe is supported by your cheerful, consistent, sacrificial giving. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And God, it warms his heart as we give sacrificially. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this time to come and worship you through song, through prayer, through, through giving, God, through fellowship, Lord, through the proclamation of your word. God, may you be honored in each and every part of this service today, God. Uh, sometimes we call it our service, but it's really your service, God. It's a service of worship to you. And God, would you help our hearts to just be prepared here today to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to set aside the things that we come in that are on our mind. Help us to come with a surrendered heart before you, God, as we sing, as we listen to your word, God. Uh, Lord, may as we receive things from you, God, may we give you back that surrender of our heart. We thank you, God, for your great provision in our life, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And God, now we worship you with the first portion of what you've given us, God. May it be a sweet aroma to you, Lord, uh, as we give it with a cheerful heart, not under guilt, not under some sort of compulsion, God, but with a cheerful, grateful heart of worship, God. And so, Lord, we pray that that uh, would be what that is to you. God, we pray, Lord, during this time, God, there's... So many people that could use a touch physically, they could use a touch financially. There's multiple people who need cars right now, even, Lord, in our congregation, Father. And so, God, we, we know, Lord, that you meet all of those needs according to your glorious riches, God. And so, God, we just pray, Lord, that you give each person a touch where they're at, whether it's physical or emotional, whether they're grieving, whether they have a financial or physical need, God, uh, we pray your hand upon each one of them, God. And may this season of waiting for those prayers to be answered be a time of our faith being grown in you, God, a time where we trust you more and more. Even in the waiting, God, may we be able to trust that you are working. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And while the ushers receive the offering at this time, I have a couple of updates for you today. Hopefully you got your Holy Week devotional. It's out in the lobby, or you might have got it on your way in. We were passing them out, but it's a, a daily devo for your Holy Week reading plan. It starts today, by the way, on Palm Sunday, ends on Easter. So it's a little more than a week. You got a bonus day. It's called Easter. Praise God for that. We do still have our bookmarks for the Identity Series. I'd encourage you to get one, get a couple. I've been reading these to myself or reading these over myself every day uh, since we printed them. Uh, and what a blessing it's been in my life to just read the truths 
of God's Word over my life. Uh, and then lastly, you should have gotten one of these by now. If you haven't, you can pick some more up at the Info Center. Remember, next week, this is just scrap paper, maybe a little fire starter. I don't know, but that's all it is. Uh, but this is power in your hand right here. It gives you an opportunity to invite someone uh, to know Jesus the way you do. We have some really special services planned uh, for you coming up. We've got Saturday at 5 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have uh, the same services at all three services, Saturday at 5 o'clock, Sunday at 9 and 11. We're baptized, and I think that counts up to 35 people this weekend here and six people at North. We're going to continue on with our Life Story series, and we're going to be sharing more testimony next weekend as well as the Word of God. So I want to encourage you, be prayerful about who am I going to invite Get to the service on time. That would be a big deal. I won't look at anybody. Just come on time, though, because those seats are going to be limited. And so uh, please, please, please invite someone. If you can come Saturday, that would be great. It would leave some space for new visitors on Sunday. So let's do that together. Uh, and then last but not least, if you're new to the church or new to the faith, our Discover Online starts this week. You can go right to our website and sign up for that. Uh, right on our homepage, you can click on it or put our, e our address in slash discover. Uh, we would love for you to be a part of that. That's a place to ask all those faith questions. If you're seeking God, if you're not sure, if you're new to the church, it's a place where you start. Before you join any community group, we want you to go to discover. And so that starts online this week. It's a great option, especially if you have a really busy weekly schedule. So that's that. Let's jump back into worship at this time. I'll turn it over to the team. Can we thank our worship team here this morning? Please stand. Church, the next song that we're going to be singing is new to us, um, but it comes, um, it's kind of written out of the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. It says, God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is, this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. As we think of those verses, even just where that starts, but God, but God, if we think of our lives, if you are in Christ today and you look at your life, we can look and say, oh man, this is what I was like before. I struggled with sin. If I was to count my sins, there would be a list that would roll and roll and roll and keep going. But for God, for God sending Christ into the world because he loved us, because he is a God who is rich in mercy and tender-hearted towards us, his creation. He sent us Jesus to live the perfect life that we could never live and to die the death that we deserved because of all of our sins. He bore those on the cross for us. And then he was raised to life on the third day so that we, we're not, we don't even just have a clean slate before God. We have Christ's righteousness on us so that before him, we are pure, we are holy, and we can worship him in the truth and in that new life that we have. And so let's just remember, wherever you're at in your spiritual journey, you can approach a God who is rich in mercy. That is his posture towards you. He is the one who seeks out the lost person that we all were without Christ. He seeks us. He chases after us. And so as we sing this next song, let's remember these things. Buried beneath my rebellion Lost without hope of redemption Blind to my need of a savior Oh, but God 
crushed by the weight of my failure Living the lie I created Digging my grave without knowing Oh, but God, oh, but God Rich in mercy, how you loved me too much to let me stay lost My salvation
Good. 
I grew up going to church, so I knew all about it. And I was in the youth band at this church as well. And um, then when I got into high school, that's when everything kind of took a turn and I had different beliefs and had a different crowd around me. I then moved to New York and um, that was a lonely time and I had no friends or family around me. So I just felt super lonely and empty. I was dabbling into witchcraft and I was setting intentions into crystals. Um, depending on sage to take my stress away and get all the negative energy away from me. I was writing down, trying to learn how to put spells on people. I was very convinced that I was a witch and I was worshiping the creation and not the creator. I was just going down the complete wrong path. Then one day I just ended up praying to God and asking him to give me the strength to leave, to move back to mass and to just, um, just go for it. And literally the next day, I ended up moving back home. When I moved back to Massachusetts, I felt like God was telling me to go back to church and I ended up passing Christ Community Church and I felt like God was telling me to go there, but I didn't want to. And then one day I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna go. So I ended up one Sunday going to Christ Community and that was when I felt like I belonged, I belonged here. And I just had this, I had my, I just had this fire for the Lord and to get closer to him and to, to really just give my life to him. I remember repenting and turning away from everything I was doing before, um, repenting of all the witchcraft and all of the, the stuff that I did in the past. And I really felt the love of God. I felt like he was telling me that it's okay, like I forgive you. You are born again, you're new through my blood. He has changed my habits and my hobbies. Like I went from, I went from like putting my pain into like smoking weed every day and drinking and um, just like going to clubs and partying. And instead of doing all that, um, I started to spend more time with God and he just convicts, he convicts me to not do those things anymore. It just doesn't feel right to do them anymore. I would have to say the way I treat people as well has been a big change. I used to not look at people as God's children. I would just look at them as, oh, like, like they're a bad person or just judge people. But now I feel like God has helped me to be humble and to just see them as his children and to not be quick to judge, but to, to just pray for them instead and to be a lot kind, more kind, to be more gentle and not be so hard and have guards up all the time with people who he surrounds me with. I feel like he's cut out literally every single person that did not benefit my life. And he replaced, not replaced, but he put people in my life that, that know him and love him and who inspire me and who lead me in the right direction. Honestly, that witchcraft gave me depression. It gave me depression, anxiety, because I had everything in my control. Like I felt like I had to have everything in my control 
and I had to do all these things in order for things to work out in my life. And I don't know, it just made me feel exhausted all the time. But now that I have Jesus and I give everything to him, whenever I'm going through a hardship, I just give it to him and I just forget about it. I'm like, here you go, it's all yours. Thank you. Like, I'm not gonna take control of the situation. And then he, he just works it all out for me. And yeah, there's definitely a big difference because I feel a lot more at peace and more calm. And I still have anxiety here and there and depression here and there, but it's, it's like once you give it to God, he takes care of it and gives you, he puts you at ease. It gives you rest. Life story. And being Palm Sunday, we consider what is celebrated on Palm Sunday is, is Jesus' victory parade. It was pre victory, actually. He had the victory parade before the victory. But the victory that's celebrated on Palm Sunday is the victory that we have in Christ Jesus, the one that he went to pay for on the cross and by being raised from the dead in the grave. And when we think about this, we know that that victory is just not momentary. It's not actually just Jesus helping us through something in life or even changing our life. Jesus is changing our life story. In fact, it's not even just him giving us the understanding of us knowing what the ending of the story is, he actually turns our ending into a beginning. And so as we jump into this life story series here in week two, we're going to go to a few places in scripture, but we're going to start today with a key verse that we're also studying in our community groups, and it's what's true, someone say that's what's true, true. about us as followers of Jesus. Jess's story is a powerful one, and maybe yours is as a drastic of a change, maybe it's less, maybe you were always that good church kid following along and you didn't have any drama in your life, but it's still a miracle just the same when someone moves from death to life, their life story has been changed. So let's, let's read this verse together, it's just one, so I'll have you stay seated here. I have been crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that you sent your Son, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for coming and and dying on the cross for us, being raised from the dead, letting us inherit that eternal life, letting us inherit that, that payment, that ransom for our sins Jesus, you've saved us, you've changed our life. Above all of that, God, you've changed our life story, all by your own choosing. You chose us before the creation of the earth, you've called us by name, you've transformed our lives. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, right now as we study your word, that these words would be your words and not mine. Holy Spirit, grab a hold of our hearts, let us not take your salvation for granted. Let us not take this life-changing reality for granted. May it change how we see life, how we think about others, how we interact with you, the places that we find our peace and hope, God. May it change us knowing that you've changed our entire eternal life story, God. We commit this time to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Luke 19, there's a, man, there's a man named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector in the city of Jericho. He was short, is what the scriptures say, just a, a wee little guy. No offense to any short friends in the room, sorry. But he was a chief tax collector. And in that time, tax collectors were the most vile people. No one liked them. The the Roman government had come in and assigned people to be tax collectors. Tax collectors were, were thieves, really, is what they were. They were despised. They were hated because they weren't just collecting taxes that, 
the Jewish people would consider unjust because the Roman government was occupying them. They were paying taxes to a government that wasn't even theirs for purposes that weren't really benefiting them. The tax collectors saw it as an opportunity to charge a little extra or a lot extra. In fact, the passage in Luke 19, it says that, that Zacchaeus was not only a chief tax collector, but he was wealthy. And he made that wealth on the backs of every person that he charged tax to. So he was despised. He was a real low life or a scumbag, if you want to use some everyday terms, in this time. He was not a good person. But he had begun to hear about this man named Jesus. He had heard about his teachings. He had heard about his miracles. He had heard about the claims that maybe he actually was the Messiah. And so then he heard that Jesus was going to be coming through Jericho, that he was on his way, and the crowd began to form, trying to get close to Jesus to see what this man was all about. News traveled in those days, house to house, person to person. There was there was no newspapers or social media or any of those things. It happened person by person, and the crowds began to gather, and here's Zacchaeus, cast out, despised by the, by the culture that he was in, but still wanting to know more about this man named Jesus, still wanting to know more if all these things were true, to, to know if these things were true about him. And so he climbed a tree, Scripture says he climbed a sycamore fig tree like a little boy to get to the top and to see Jesus. And in Jesus' way, coming by, he looks up and he calls him by name. Zacchaeus! That's how he said it, I think. No. But he called Zacchaeus by name. And he tells Zacchaeus to come down for I'm going to have dinner at your house. It wasn't a question. It was a statement that this is what's going to happen. We know God does that in our life sometimes. It's not a question. It's a statement. God says, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to go there, or we're doing this thing, and we go, wait. And Zacchaeus, without hesitation, invites him into his house. But the crowd, it was at their displeasure. They didn't like this. They didn't like that Jesus, first off, was associating with a tax collector. They couldn't believe it, the scum of the earth. They're thinking, why is Jesus going to hang out with this person? And I can only imagine that some were thinking, why not me, God? Why is Jesus going to go have dinner with him? I, I bake way better than, than that household does. My house is bigger. I'm a better person. Jesus should be coming and dining with me. But no, Jesus goes to the, one of the most despised people during that time in this area of Jericho, and he has dinner with Zacchaeus, while others scoffed and mocked and complained can only imagine what that conversation looked like. Scripture doesn't give us the details of that, but by knowing Jesus, we know what he talked about. We know that reclining at the table as they did in those days, it was a casual, lengthy time having a meal together, not a rushed, hurried meal like we would have. We can only imagine that he'd be sharing those parables about the kingdom of heaven. We can only imagine that he'd be talking about the prophecies about himself. He'd be talking about the truths of salvation and repentance and forgiveness for all who would believe and redemption and the ability to be adopted in to the family of God, to be in that line of God's chosen people through Abraham. You know that as we know the stories that Jesus would share, he'd be sharing those stories with Zacchaeus. And after that time at dinner, after being struck by, first off, the fact that Jesus knew his name, that Jesus asked to be invited into his home, after that time of him dining with the filthy sinner that he was, after that time of sharing who he was, Jesus got a hold of Zacchaeus' heart. And we're going to pick the passage up here in verse 8. If we could jump to verse 8 for a moment. Jesus grabbed a hold of his heart says this, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back, someone say four times. Four times, four times 
the amount. You see, Zacchaeus was struck by Jesus. He believed in the Messiah. He gave his life to him in that moment, and that, that moment changed his life story, not just his life. It wasn't just a salvation moment. It wasn't just an offloading of guilt. He jumped up. You can imagine little Zacchaeus. Hey! Sorry, I keep picking on his height. Sorry, all my friends who are a little, little uh, height challenged, but either way, you can just imagine his exuberation in this, he says, look, there's an exclamation point. He goes, I'm convinced, I'm convicted of how I've lived my life. You have come and shared this with me, offering me this forgiveness. I'm going to go and give half of what I have, half of what I have to the poor. I'm going to pay back four times what I've stolen from other people, four times that amount to those who I stole it from. That was a radical, life-changing moment. In Matthew 13, Jesus says that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought that field. Zacchaeus is this man. He, he had all these riches and all this wealth that he acquired in an improper, unethical, oppressive kind of way, but he still did it. He still had it. He was finding some sort of solace and home, and he was putting his faith in those things, and he said, no, all of that is wrong. I, I got it wrongfully. It's not actually going to save me, and, and I found this treasure, and now I'm going to do everything I can in my power to sell it all and to buy fully and wholly in to Jesus. You see, when Jesus gets a hold of our life, when Jesus gets a hold of our heart, it's to radically change our life story. Jesus did something radical for Zacchaeus. He did something radical for us, and he expects a radical response. He expects us to now live under a different narrative because that story has changed. And because, not because of Zacchaeus' is giving it all to the poor and doing all these charitable and generous and sacrificial things, but because of Zacchaeus' faith in the gift of salvation through Christ and Christ alone, Jesus says this to him. He says, today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. Not even because of what he did afterwards, which God is honored by, but because of his faith, his faith to seek him with his whole heart, his, his faith to climb that tree, to do something that a grown man wouldn't do during those times, to invite him into his home, and then to fully buy in to all that Jesus is and what the gospel, that good news of who he was. And then he says this. Think about those scoffers saying, Jesus is going to go and hang out with the vilest of sinners? Really? Really? I can't believe he's going to do that. Can you imagine the Pharisees that were around, those religious hierarchies, the, the goody-goodies in the room saying, I'm better than everyone else. Can you imagine what they were saying? I can't believe he's going to go eat with him. Jesus says this in verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. I don't know about you, but I identify with that statement because once I was lost and now I'm found. Amen? As we consider Jesus changing his life story, we have to consider for ourselves, where were we before Jesus came into our life? Where are you today? Maybe you're still on that other side of faith in Christ Jesus. Maybe you more identify with the past things in your life than you do with who you are, that Galatians 2.20, that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. But Zacchaeus' story was a tough one. It, he was greedy he was despised, he was hated, he was oppressive. He was an oppressor for the Roman oppressors in that time. That's who he was. And he was a chief of sinners. But Christ came into his life and look what he transformed him into. God's story for Zacchaeus looks like this. He was now accepted. The person who was despised and cast out and hated by everyone was accepted. He was forgiven. He turned his heart to be repentant, which just means to turn, by the way. It means that our heart is turned to follow him. He was transformed, and now he had a testimony. We've been talking around here 
over the last few weeks about our testimony. We heard an amazing one from Jess today. We heard one from Courtney last week. We have another one that you're not going to want to miss either next weekend on Easter. But let's think about Zacchaeus' testimony for a moment. I think sometimes we miss something in the story of Zacchaeus because we've, we've told this story a bunch over the years in Sunday school and vacation Bible school. I remember one time we were in this little tiny room with 40 kids in this sweaty room. It was me and Mario and Bree and Sarah in Honduras, and there was 30 kids around us, and I was the tree, and Mario was Zacchaeus, and somehow I held him up. He climbed me, and we told the story, and you know we, we share all of that, which is good, but we, we simplify the story. We miss some certain pieces of the details of the story because we have often reduced it to a kid's story. Zacchaeus was not a child, though. In fact, He was a tax collector, but it says that he was a chief tax collector. I want you to think for a moment. Here's this person, scum of the earth. When they saw him coming, people shudder in their windows, hide in their pocket in a little extra cash because they don't want to be giving it to the government, man. Know what I'm saying? Anybody in the room. And so he's doing all they can to avoid this person because he's going to take more than he's owed, and he's going to do it oppressively. But he stands up and he says, hey, I'm going to give half of my wealth to the poor. Talk about changed lives, changing lives. Imagine the poor that were in his area at the time that received all of that wealth. Can you imagine the testimony that was? Can you imagine that those poor folks looking up saying, why are you doing this? And it's because I met a man and his name was Jesus. He touched my heart. He showed me the error of my ways. He forgave me of my sins. I've come to the place where I realized I've, I've gotten this money by ill gain and I want to give it back. And he can't pay it back to Jesus, but he can pay it forward to those in need in the name of Jesus. Can you imagine the testimony that was? How about all those that he cheated? Can you, can you picture the line at his money changer's table out front of his home or wherever he set up shop? Can you picture that line of all the people that he cheated and he's now only got 50% of the wealth that he once had and he's given back four times? Four times. There's no pension plan or IRA or money market account that's paying you back four times. That's God's kingdom plan. He gave them back four times what they were cheated. That is a transformed life. That's a transformed heart. That is a testimony about a changed life story that changes the world around us. You see, our life story isn't just for us. In fact, once we've accepted Christ, God's changed our life story, but now we're to be a witness and a testimony And if the people in our life don't know that Jesus changed our life story, we got to ask ourselves, why? Has the world around us, the culture around us, the people that we come into contact with, do they know? Have they taken notice? Are there the actions and the fruit of our life display the fact that Christ has changed not just our life, that's important, not just saved us, but he's changed our whole life story. He changed our ending into a beginning. Have we responded as radically as Christ radically died for us on the cross there's more though you see he was a chief tax collector not just a tax collector what that meant was is that he was in charge of the other tax collectors in the area he was the head tax collector can you imagine the other tax collectors when he stepped out with them knowing all full well remember everything spread by word of mouth then okay they wouldn't have been putting it on instagram reels or anything they would have been sharing it to say can you you know what that guy zach did man he showed up with half of his wealth and gave it to the poor what was he thinking at first you can imagine these other tax collectors just being in fear being upset being angry because you you broke the bro code right there, man. We got this tax code that we're living by and we're supposed to be getting extra for ourselves. Can you imagine the testimony that that sent? And then he had to own the fact that he had cheated people. We missed this in the story. He had to own his sin that he committed towards other people. I think it's easy for me to confess my sins to God that that I've that I've sinned against him. For some reason, that seems easier because it's quiet and it's private and it's in my own heart and no one needs to know. But for me to look at John or Dave or Dan and say, hey, I sinned against you. I did this thing. And I want to do my very best to show you 
how sorrowful I am, how repentant I am. I want to make restitution to the best way I can possible. He had to own the fact that he was living as a sinner. He had to own the fact that he had cheated hundreds of people probably. And now he said, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the genuineness of my heart, the genuineness of my life change because I met a man named Jesus and I'm going to give you back four times what I cheated you. Can you imagine the testimony that that sent to those tax collectors that he was over, the influence that he had? Now, we don't know. The narrative doesn't tell us if he continued on as the chief tax collector. Maybe he got fired. I don't know if that was a thing back then. But we best know that if he did continue on as the chief tax collector, that there was going to be some ethics happening amongst that tax collection. We need to understand that he would have had the power and the influence to change how business was being done in that area. Let me tell you this, church. We, in our life, in our homes, in our workplaces, we need to have that boldness, that radical faith to be able to stand up and say, Jesus changed my life story. Come, come high water, by hook or by crook, I am going to do the right thing. When it matters, when it doesn't matter, I'm going to do the right thing when someone's looking. I'm going to do the right thing when no one's looking. I'm going to do the right thing by other people. I'm going to stand for the truth of the Word of God. I'm going to stand by the truth of my Lord and Savior in good times and in bad because that's, that's who I've given my life to because He's changed my life story. The world around us is changed by that when we step out and do something radical. When we reduce stories in the Bible, though, to kids' stories, we miss the meaning of all this. Zacchaeus is a real man, and someday we're going to meet him in heaven, and we're going to be like, hey, was that true? Did you continue on as the chief tax collector? Maybe we won't care when we get there, but I kind of want, I got some questions. I want to talk to some folks. I'll have eternity to sit around and have coffee. There'll be coffee in heaven. And so we're going to sit around and have coffee, ask some questions. There'll be coffee and bread. I know Conrad's looking forward to the bread. But we'll meet him. He's a real person. This really happened. We've got to understand this is not a fable or a story or some nice thing to hear. This is a real man that a real thing happened to. And he went from being despised to accepted and forgiven and repented and transformed. What's your life story look like? Does your life story tell God's story? When I was a kid, we used to read these books called Choose Your Own Adventure. I don't know if we can get that photo up there, Choose Your Own Adventure. Anyone remember these books in the room? I'm dating myself right now. If you're a kid, you can still get them on Amazon. The premise of these books, though, were whatever the main character was, you became the main character in the story. You took on that person. And as you read, you got to the end of the chapter, you could choose what page you went to with different storylines. And so you could choose one or the other, and then it would come to a different ending. And so there was a multitude of different paths you could go down, very creatively written. It was really cool. I just remember tearing up a couple of those books, and then I think it was our parents tricking us, so we'd read the book a couple of times because it could keep ending different ways. It was really a creative way. It was called Choose Your Own Adventure. We were the main character, and we tried our best to try and make the choices to have the right ending, to figure out all the things, that the clues in the book, and, and have the best possible ending at the end. And you'd be reading it and realize, uh-oh, I made the wrong choice. So either you had ethics and you kept reading, or you went back and made a different choice and started over. I recently read an article, though. Someone did a study on one of the books. They did an analysis on the Choose Your Own, Choose Your Own Story, Choose Your Own Adventure books. And what he did was is he categorized how that ended depending on the choices. So he went through all the possible variations of the choices in the book. Praise God for him, I don't have that much patience. But he did it, and he categorized them. Do you know what he found out? Not one single one of the endings, regardless of the combination, had a perfect ending. Not one of them had all the things figured out in the life of that book. No, no character figured out all the clues or all the questions. They always ended with, a, with another question. In fact, some of them ended up in peril. They had a very tragic ending. If you didn't read the book right, uh, the book ended abruptly because the ending wasn't good. Not one of them, though, was a perfect ending. As I reflect on my life and the lives of others who were involved in each other's lives, I realize that that's us. We treat this life like a choose-your-own-adventure book. 
We make ourselves the main character of our story. We're the main character, and we're just doing our best to make choices that are, that are going to turn out okay, hopefully has a perfect ending, or we find that happy ever after. We're trying to make choices that are going to hopefully bring us peace and joy and hope, and we make one choice after the other. And then sometimes we make the wrong choice and wish we could go back and make a different choice, and then we live in regret because we can't make that choice over again, and now we've got to live with it. Am I speaking the truth to anybody in the room here today? But you see, that's how we live. I thought about Zacchaeus, and I thought about our own lives, and I considered the fact that, yeah, this is a choose-your-own-adventure. Zacchaeus made some radical choices in response to a radical salvation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. We also, though, need to understand that we are no longer in a choose-your-own-adventure story. When we said yes to Jesus... We're no longer the main character. Jesus is the main character. We no longer get to choose all the things we want to do and where we're going to go and try and figure it all out. Our faith and trust says, Jesus, you have it figured out. You make the choices. I'm going to follow. In fact, we need to understand, too, that Zacchaeus, when he climbed that tree, he acted as a small child. He came to Jesus with a trusting, believing innocent heart that said, yeah, I'm going to reach up and grab a hold of his hand and where he leads me, I'm going to follow. That's the heart that we see in this passage that we need to come to Jesus with and say to him, I am no longer the main character in my own story. I'm no longer going to try and choose this, that, or the other thing and trying to figure it all out because you came and told me that you have it all figured out. I'm going to trust in you with my life. I'm going to allow you to lead me in this new life story that I have And I trust that you have the ending all figured out. You know, it gives us a new lens in life, doesn't it? It it gives us the ability to see things from a different perspective because we know how it ends. In fact, it doesn't end. It's a new beginning because our last breath here is our first breath in the presence of the Lord for eternity. And now we go through life. We We don't have to worry about YOLO or FOMO or regret or shame or any of the things that we go through in life like, oh, I don't know if this or that or the other thing. And My life's going to amount to anything. Your life already does because Christ paid for it on the cross. He's given you a purpose and a plan and a direction and an eternal relationship with him. Everything else is secondary now in our life because he's the main character. He's decided our ending and he's invited us in to be his child. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team back up at this time. But I want you to consider this because in Revelation 3.20, there's a letter to different churches. It's a letter to different churches in Revelation. And there's a statement to one of the churches. But it's a statement really to all the churches. And Jesus says this, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, this isn't just about having a meal with Jesus. We have got to understand this in light of what it meant for Jesus to invite himself over to Zacchaeus' house. We can leave that verse up for a moment because Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. Many of you have invited him in. Maybe many of us have dined with him, but have we allowed him to change our life story or are we still living this choose-your-own-adventure type of way? Are we still living by our own choices, our own standards, and hoping Jesus will bless it? Have we come to Christ so he can help us out of a, do us a solid and help us in one or two situations? Have we just seen Jesus as some some self-help pathway of many self-help pathways that helps us to better our life? Or have we said, no, Jesus, you are my life? You see, Zacchaeus was looking for truth. He was looking for a way. And all of a sudden, he said yes to Jesus coming into his home and dining with him. And he realized all of a sudden the truth that he was looking for was sitting with him at the table because he is himself called the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And that's who Zacchaeus realized he was with. And that's who we have to realize we're with when we answer this call to allow him in and to dine with us. But it's the first of an everyday meal with him, not a one-time thing. We've got to ask ourselves that question. Are we living this new life story for Christ Jesus? Have we invited him in? He's calling your name, and he continues to call your name after you've said yes to him as Savior to say, come follow me. He's saying, Michael, Michelle, I stand at the door and knock. I want to come in and eat with you. Follow me. 
Kim, follow me. Will you go where I'm leading you? Will you allow me to take you into ministry full time? I know that's a call in your heart. So he can allow you to do that. Chris and Tara, Jesus is saying, I'm standing at the door to knock. Are you allowing him to change your life story? Are you going where he's going to lead you? Looking at Mike and Mary over here, are you, are you hearing God's call to say, take me where I can follow? Aaron, I see you sitting beside him there. Are you going to go where God's following you? Are you going to allow him to change your life story knowing that he's already changed the end of the story? Church, put your name there. He's calling you by name. He's saying, come down from that tree. You found me. You're with me, and I'm with you. I want you to come and follow me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and I will come in and eat with that person and they with me if you'll let me. Some of what Jesus is calling us to do is to live our life in him out loud so the lives around us change. Does the world around us, do our neighbors and friends and family members know that we're a follower of Jesus? Do they, do they know because of the way we now live our life, because of who we give glory to, but the standards we live by? Do they know? Do they know that Jesus just isn't our Savior because we have a bumper sticker or a t-shirt, but they know that he's changed our life and our life story? They'll only know by how you live that repentant response, that living a transformed life. Like the testimony we've heard from Jess today, I know many of you have a testimony to share, to live out. Behold, he stands at the door and knocks. He's asking you to say, come follow me, but it's gonna take the faith of a child. Many of us who've been saved a long time, we dismiss this as a salvation verse, no. Our entire life until Christ calls us home, we need to come to him like a child, trusting and believing and having faith to hold his hand and allowing him to lead us where he follows. Would you stand with me here this morning? We're going to pray and then we're going to close <clears throat> with a song of worship. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this time here today. God, we love you. We thank you. Each one of us, God, has been called by name. You know our name. And you've invited us in to live a new life story. You've changed our end into a beginning. You've transformed our life. God, I just say on behalf of all of us that are still living like we're in this choose-your-own-adventure book, that we've been trying to make our own choices, trying to figure it all out, trying to decide our own path, when, and we've also continued to make ourselves the main character in our own story when when, when we made you the Lord of our life, you are the main character. So God, I, I pray on behalf of all of us, please please forgive me, please forgive us. We, we want to turn and repent from that and put you back in the driver's seat of our life, put you back on the throne of our heart. Where you lead us, we will follow God. God, I pray for those who haven't, haven't said yes to you yet. Maybe they've been seeking after you. Maybe they've been curious about you. May they hear you calling them by name here today. And Jason and Stephanie and Peter and whatever the name is here in the room that you're calling them by name. Not just to save them, but to save them, to change their life and to change their life story. And if that's you here today, I want to encourage you to ask Jesus into your life. Right where you are, you can say, Jesus, I believe in who you are. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe that God raised you from the dead. I want to make you the Lord of my life. Where you lead me, I will follow. If you pray that prayer, just in the quietness of your heart in this place right now, receive him in. Answer that call that he wants to come and and be in your life permanently. If you're doing that, you just need to know that the Holy Spirit's now coming and making his dwelling place in you right in this moment. God the Father has called you his son or daughter, that you have a, a new life story that's begun here in this place today. God, we love you and we celebrate with you here today 
May we make your name great in and above all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship together. Before we dismiss, I just wanted to mention, if you um, didn't hear Matt earlier, please remember, you can actually give your Connect card to um, a person with a name tag um, or the boxes in the back. Um, so church, we hope you are blessed by this. Um, get ready, get pumped for Easter, right? And be sure to grab your palms on the way out. You are dismissed.
silent surely it was through since when has impossible ever stopped you Friday's disappointment Sunday's empty tomb since when has impossible ever stopped Is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. the sound of tribal's rattling. 